theme that came up in this podcast today with Dr. Gladys Cruz was mentorship. And it's something I'm really passionate about. And I looked up this quote and it really struck me. And I thought a lot about it uh, after we had the conversation. And it's from Bob Proctor. And he says this, a mentor is someone who sees more talent and ability within you than you see in yourself and helps bring it out of you. That is exactly what I think about when I think about some of the incredible mentors that I've had in my life, whether it's personal or professional. And I'm going to give you two challenges when you're listening to this podcast to really kind of consider. Think about the success that you have in your work today and who are some of the people that have helped you to make that impact that maybe pushed you at a time that you weren't necessarily ready to be pushed and they got you to a level that you probably wouldn't have got to if it wasn't for them. Take some time and reach out to them. Thank them for their time. Ensure that they know that they were part of that trajectory change uh, in your life. I think it is really important to share that gratitude. But the second thing I'm going to challenge you with is also you can have more mentors in your life too. I know I do this. One of the things that I've done since I've moved here to Orlando is I've reached out to people that I want to learn from, that I see some of the things that they're doing in their life, whether it's personally or professionally, and I just reach out. And sometimes they don't reach back out to me, and that's okay. But more often than not, they have. Never hesitate to reach out to people that you aspire to. It is really easy to live in a world where we're seeing stuff on social media all the time, to get really jealous and not really uh, identify that as jealousy, that people have something that you don't have. For me, what's really crucial when I talk about this idea of the innovator's mindset, I'll say, what is that person doing that I'm not and how can I learn from them? And sometimes the best way to figure out how I can learn from them is to reach out and ask them. How do you get to some of the things that you're doing and how do I get to that point? So I encourage you to think about those two questions as um, those two thoughts as you're listening to this wonderful podcast with Dr. Gladys Cruz. She's absolutely an incredible educator. Lots to learn from her. And I, I really hope you enjoy this, this podcast as much as I did. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed today to have Dr. Gladys Cruz. She is actually the superintendent of Questar 3, uh, BOCES in the, in the New York area. And I'm going to ask you to tell a little bit about where that name came from because I was like, what is Questar 3? It sounds like it's an outer space. I don't know what's going on. Um, I worked with your schools. Absolutely uh, amazing people, amazing group of educators. Um, you're also the incoming president for the, it's the, uh, um, it's AASA, but it's like the national superintendents organization. So I don't know why national superintendents are, so I don't know why it's, I think NSA was taken by something else. I don't know. That's a governmental agency or something like that. And so you do so many incredible things, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to say any more. If you can tell us uh, all a little bit about who you are, what you do today and how you got there, that's a great place to start. Okay, thank you so much for having me on uh, today, George. Uh, so um, I'm the district superintendent of uh, Quest R3 BOCES, and uh, uh, Quest R3 is one of 37 BOCES across New York State. Um, each one of them has different programs and services based on their local needs. Uh, in my, my BOCES, Quest R3 BOCES, serves 22 districts in three counties. Uh, we also provide uh, statewide services to close to 700 districts in BOCES. Um, where the name came from. So the name uh, changed in 1994 as part of a strategic planning process. The name Quest R3 is a combination of two words, Quest and Star. And the three represents the three counties we serve, which are Rensselaer, Columbia, and Greene counties in upstate New York. The word quest represents the pursuit of knowledge and the educational mission of the agency. And our mission is changing lives, realizing dreams and doing together what can't be done alone. The word star represents the agency's commitment to excellence and the idea that it serves as a guiding light for the communities it serves. Um, 
it was created by the legislature mm -hmm. in 1948 to help districts uh, share resources, reduce costs, and provide programs and services that might not otherwise be possible. I am, uh, I've been here for 25 years. I've had different roles and I'm super excited to be with you today. Yeah, no, and it, it's it, it it's just a, a incredible to, you know, I love the aspirational aspect of that. Um, we talked about innovation that day um, with your group and really being, uh, you know, there, there's, we all know this, there's things that are negative in education, things that aren't going great. And that's always going to be a reality as it would be in any other organization. But really the thing that I appreciated was how solution focused um, everyone was there. It's not about ignoring problems, but actually finding solutions. Like if you dwell on them too much, it doesn't actually ever solve anything and very solution focused. And you can kind of see that in, in the aspirational nature of the name. Now you are uh, the incoming president of the National Superintendents or, uh, so, or the AASA. The I, School oh, Superintendents I, Association. AASA. 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 So um, credible group. Kind of what is your, tell us a little bit about that role and, you know, kind of like, what is the, what does the president do? Because I know you're, you're president-elect, become president, and then past president. So, like, what is your role in that? And kind of what are some of the aspirations uh, of the work that you're trying to do with that organization? So, um, so uh, the, the organization has uh, officers. It uh, has an executive committee um, with representatives from across the nation. And it has officers... Um, has a president, um, a past president, and an incoming president, president-elect. Um, so we work closely with the executive director of ASA and um, the staff of ASA. Um, my goal really is um, is to really, you know, and I talked about this at the last NCE conference, my goal is really to continue to uh, work on some of the um, uh, professional development they have done in developing new and aspiring superintendents. Um, you know, I, I, poll, I, I polled the executive committee um, last year and I just asked, how many new superintendents have do you have in your state the last past uh, in the last past three years? Mm -hmm. And it was incredible um, the amount of turnover and during the pandemic. And you know, we hear a lot about teacher shortages, and um, but you know, the the highlight on on superintendents ha has you know hasn't been there. Um, so I hope to make that part of my um, presidency, really to, to continue to build on some amazing programs. I co-lead a aspiring superintendent um, academy for Latino and Latina leaders with a superintendent from um, uh, Arizona, Dr. Lupita Hightower. And then we have... Um, mentors from across the nation that, that serve as mentors for the aspirants. It, it's just an amazing program. We learn so much from them as uh, they learn from us and from all the guests that we bring to speak to them. We bring in um, sitting superintendents. Uh, so it, it's, it's about continuing to build that pipeline and especially the diverse pipeline hmm. so that um, we have more uh, top leaders that look like the students in our districts. That And we were talking about that before the, the, the mentorship program um, for the Latino Latino superintendents association. And I, I, I am so big on that and how we actually connect that because it's not, it's not just the mentors that are distilling wisdom to the mentees, but it, it is a back and forth process, right? And I, I know that's something that you're really passionate about. 
So how do you see that mentorship program? How has it led to, because I, I think you, you ha, you've had several cohort, cohorts already. How have you seen that kind of come to play with helping um, not only uh, people go into the superintendent position, but actually be successful? Because I think it's one thing to accept the job, but it's another thing to actually be really good at it. How has that mentorship program really kind of helped facilitate that process? So it's it's really neat because what happens is with um, the mentor and, and and mentees and the entire cohort, it becomes like a network. Mm -hmm. And you know how important networks are. Oh. So um, and then, you know, we we offer guidance and we you know, we we tell our, our aspiring uh Latino superintendents, if you are going to an interview, feel free to reach out to us mm -hmm. and we'll be happy to to do a mock interview or, you know, whatever you need. Um, and then stay connected, stay connected with the your cohort, with your mentors, with all the guests that we bring, because they all uh, give them their their contact information. They say, if you ever need something, reach out right. to me. Um, so that whole, it's, it becomes a really big na uh, national network. And then, of course, we tell them stay connected through your, your state and right. your national associations because you need, you need to be connected. This is, I mean, it could be a lonely uh, job, but mm -hmm. that's if you make it lonely. You know, if you surround yourself with others, it's not so lonely. Well, it's, it's funny because when I first became a uh, principal, that that felt like such an isolating position, right? Because and even more so in the superintendent position, right? Because way fewer superintendents than there are administrators and there are teachers. Uh, you kind of feel like you're on an island. That when you make a decision, is you know all eyes on you. And the reason I actually started connecting through social media, kind of connecting, was to do exactly what you said: was to network, was to connect with people, and to kind of find out like, Hey, is this thing I'm doing crazy or does this make sense? And sometimes you're like, no, no, no. Like, here's what I would do. Here's some of this. And like, or sometimes I get, no, no, do not do that. Which was also helpful too. Right. And that to me is such an important aspect of it because sometimes when people get into roles, they're ready to accept the role, but they don't necessarily thrive because they don't reach out after. And when I moved to Florida, a, a friend of mine said, I asked him how he met so many people. And he said this, and it really shifted how I look at my time here. He said, I made it my business to, make, to meet these people. And I, I really try to do that, make different connections when I'm here, learn from different people. Um, and, you know, not always do exactly what they say, but learn from their experience. And I, I felt that when I first started admin, it accelerated um, my knowledge because I had years and years of experience to tap into. So I, I love that program. Um, you, one of the things you talked about before we we're um, kind of prepping for the show as well, you do some work with students and they go kind of through a political process. And I thought that was really interesting. Can you tell everyone a little bit about that and, and what that looks like? Cause I thought that was really interesting of how we kind of, you know, develop leaders today to really ensure that they are successful tomorrow. Absolutely. So it, it's uh, the Angelo del Toro Puerto Rican Hispanic Youth Leadership Institute. It's been in existence for 33 years um, in New York State. Um, it grew out of the need. Um, it was late Assemblyman Angelo del Toro who felt that not enough Hispanics were voting, were getting involved in the political process. So he said, you know, maybe if we get them earlier, and if we um, get them when they're in high school and we teach them how a bill becomes a law and, you know, the branches of government and they are able to actually participate, be, you know, um, in, in, a, in a mock assembly, maybe they can then become advocates. They can be pioneers and, and become leaders mm -hmm. and, and bring others along. So um, with that, you know, belief, he created this program in collaboration with the New York State Education Department, and um, in particular with a former director of the Office of Bilingual Education, uh, Carmen Perez Hogan. And uh, they, they 
you know, when I came here in 1993 from Puerto Rico, they, they were doing this program. I was immediately attracted. I started as a volunteer and um, we bring together uh, up to 275 students from across the state of New York. Uh, this, uh, we just celebrated it in um, March, March 10th through March 12th. And we, you know, the students were able to take on the roles of um, all of the assembly members, uh, the role of the, of the um, governor. And, you know, they take these roles very seriously and they prepare to do a mock assembly in the assembly chamber. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an amazing experience that changes their lives. They will tell you and they stay connected. Here's another way of networking. They stay connected for years. They make those friends that are friends for life. Um, and they and we have a lot of uh, the of the students that go through this program that come back and they want to volunteer and they want to give back. Some become teachers, some become trainers in the program. So you always have that ongoing connection. Um, and it, it, you know, it's an amazing uh, experience for students to actually, um, for one day, sit in the seat of an assembly member mm -hmm. and make laws. So that's yeah. what the program is about. And it's, uh, you know, we do a lot of leadership development, advocacy. We have a whole training manual um, uh, on our website. And it's, it's, it just is another example of, you know, being able to change lives for students. Well, and when we were talking about it, one of the things that really struck me is you, you're, you discussed the importance of the 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 students participating in this kind of understanding issues from multiple sides and kind of you know arguing and debating that through that process and you know we probably kind of grew up in the same generation and you know this was something that was instilled into me when i was a kid and i've kind of adopted this but something struck me and they said uh you should never talk politics and religion with strangers and that was just kind of how I was brought up. I don't know if that was similar, you know, and, you know, that was kind of like how I've kind of been. And I remember seeing um, this, this meme uh, online and it really struck me. It said, when we were kids, we should not have been taught to not talk politics and religion with strangers. What we should have been taught is how do we talk politics and religion with strangers in a civil manner? And that, that really hit me. And, you know, if, if we are teaching our kids and, and to be honest, you and modeling it, cause I don't know if the adults are really good at modeling this right now. And, you know, it's kind of leading to a lot of like, how do we actually disagree in civil ways? How do we have to, to, you know, move people forward and really kind of talk about this. And so that's why I was, I was really struck with not only um, you being a part of that program, but kind of the, the tenants and kind of what you talked about. And I, I that really, is something I think is, is it really matters to our to our kids right now that they're not just hopefully seeing it from the adults, which they sh should be more. <laughs> I'm sure you and I agree on that. Right, right. But no, it's it's. Let me let me just tell you, it's you know they have to follow parliamentary procedures, so they have to learn it, yeah. um, and follow it, and so it's that whole give and take in in a civil way. Right. And respecting each other's perspectives. Um, so we we integrate. I was telling you, we integrate the uh, critical uh, thinking framework. Um, so, you know, the, the students uh, learn to break down the bills that they're going to be debating um, through, you know, the 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 elements of critical thinking. What is what is the perspective? You know, where is the data that supports this is what we should be. We, we should be. Um, proposing um what is the what, what was the sponsor thinking about what problem was he or she trying to solve here right. um so and and we select the bills that impact the hispanic community so that is something so they they are bills that speak to them mm -hmm. and they 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 show their passion um when they stand up and uh debate the bills it's it's just uh, you know they they are they are learning how to do um, politics in a civil and respectful mm -hmm. way. Well, which maybe is really important. 
maybe we should get those kids to teach some of the adults, <laughs> right? Might not be the worst idea. You know? So guess what? You know, adults come and watch them. Okay, good. And they are always uh, amazed good. by the work that the the students do. <laughs> it's um, you know, I'll 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 shoot out a, a very quick uh, uh you know um video that we did. It's about two minutes. Um, it, it's just um. You know the the kids have this this opportunity of coming together. They this year there was a hundred representing one hundred thirty nine high schools, and they come together for an entire weekend, and they get to know each other, make new friends, debate bills. You know, um, but it, all in a very collegial way, which is yeah. so important. You know, one of the things that, and I, there's, there's a reason I wanted to point this out too. And it wasn't just the program. I thought, I think the program is really powerful, obviously. Right. But there, a lot of times when people go into a superintendency position or, or have, you know, kind of tying back this to mentorship, they'll say, no, I don't want to do that. Cause I don't, I don't want to, like, I want, I want to be around kids. I'm like, well, you can still be around kids. Right. In fact, it's probably better if you're around kids because you're making decisions with that. And so I really appreciate it when you were telling me that, that you made sure that you always had that connection to kids in different programs, whether it's in your your role in in your in your BOCES or whether it's, you know, outside doing this program as well. Like that to me is that's a misconception. Now, do some superintendents totally disconnect from kids? Yep. I've seen that, too. But I'm always a big believer. You make the job the way you want it to be. And if, if you believe you want to be around students, you can still do that as a superintendent. Like, would you agree with that? Like, I think that's I totally agree. Let me tell you what I've been doing this year. So my focus this year has been to talk to kids in mm -hmm. our program. And so I go and ask them like three questions. What is working really well? Mm -hmm. If you could change something of your program, what would that be? Mm -hmm. And how can we make it better for you? I go ask them. And yeah. when I ask them those questions, I, bring, I'm sorry, I take notes, I bring it back, I speak to the administrators, and changes have been made. You know, yeah. like students have told me, this program is so redundant. It, you know, I'd rather be taking, and this was in, 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 in our STEM high school at the Hudson Valley Community College, I'd rather be taking other college courses. Right. So I said, let's get rid of this. They, they don't, they get it. Mm -hmm. They don't need this. Um, so um, that is, you know, and that's powerful. You, but you have to come back and you have to make, they need to see that change is made. They right? to totally. And that's like. I, I have uh, I've had the privilege of like being, you know, speaking at student uh, voice conferences. They bring the students there and they're like, we want to hear from you. What would we change about school? And they just listen to them, but they don't do anything. I'm like, well, that's I, I almost uh, I'm almost just don't waste my time. Don't ask me questions if you're not interested in actually doing something with feedback. And and is it realistic that everything a kid says, you know, at their age, we act upon and do. No, I don't believe that either. But you should also be able to say like, hey, here's some of the things you suggested and here's some of the changes make and here's some of the things you also suggested and here's why we can't change this. Like actually, that's a learning opportunity, right? Totally, totally. And I, I that that just, it, it, I'm, like ex I'm like excited but frustrated by that answer because that does drive me crazy. Like, oh, we need to listen to student voice. Hey, they don't agree with us. Yeah, let's not listen to them anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, well, no, you like that. We're we have to. If you're gonna ask for feedback, be open to to um, you know acting upon it. So that that's a, a great example. Uh, so the last question I have for you, we are this is being posted kind of nearing to the end of the year. So what advice would you have for educators as they're going into the to the last maybe few weeks, maybe a couple months uh, of the school year? So right around this time, I know there, the schools across the country are, you know, have a break. Um, uh, take some time off, the, um, go outside, do some exercises, walk, um, whatever, um, you know, whatever makes you happy, um, re-energize. And, um, uh, you know, the, the next 
few months are about celebrations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, celebrations of uh, students, um, you know, accomplishments uh, for the year, in some cases, accomplish accomplishments for their uh, P-12 journey, graduations, um, you know, so just, just, you know, we've, we've been through a lot these past few years mm -hmm. and, um, you know, our, our, our children are resilient. Our staff is resilient. Um, you know, we're doing some amazing things for kids across the nation. So I want to give a shout out to every superintendent across the nation. Thank you for all you do, um, each day to make, uh, the lives of for our children better. All right. Um, well, you, you said this word shout out, so I gotta, I gotta get one of those. So, so um, yes, and then just you know, uh, we have a few months, um, and it's about celebrating our accomplishments. And let's, uh, you know, positivity is a, is a great place to be. I love it, and and glass. I think that's why you know um, I, I connected with you. You sh you shared a really nice tweet. Uh, after the fact, you you really set the tone before I even spoke. So I, I just want to I wanted to have you on the podcast. So um, what a pleasure it is for me. And again, please say hi to to your community because uh, they they really made a positive impact with me. So everyone, thank you so much for listening, Gladys. Thanks so much for taking the time. I look forward to connecting in the future very soon. Thank you so much. All right, have a have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye.